Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this week's Health for the World Radiology Grand Rounds. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell, tell us where you're logging in from. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this week, Dr. Kwan Nguyen. And he'll be giving a talk on breast cancer screening, imaging tools, identifying high-risk patients, and ordering exams. Dr. Nguyen is an Associate Professor of Radiology at Baylor College of Medicine and he trained in diagnostic radiology at State University of New York downstate. Subsequently, he continued fellowship training in breast imaging at University of Washington. Dr. Nguyen has also won numerous awards, including the University of Texas System Distinguished Teaching Professor Award. Um, so welcome, Dr. Nguyen. Um, we will have a Q&A session after the lecture, so please feel free to add any questions you may have in the Q&A box. And without further ado, Dr. Nguyen, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Abhinav, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, this opportunity to present uh, to uh, everyone around the world. Uh, I appreciate this. Uh, it's an honor. So this is today's agenda, uh, what we'll be going over. So what I'll start off with is uh, identifying high-risk patients. Well, I mean, what I... I I'm going to start off uh, with clinical highlights, but what I want to emphasize in this presentation is identifying high-risk patients because that's something that we are not doing very well of, well as a community. So clinical highlights. When I see patients, they always say, I don't have a family history. And what they don't know is that only about 15 to 20 percent of women diagnosed with breast cancer have a family history of breast cancer. So just because you don't have a family history doesn't mean that you won't get breast cancer. Also in clinic, uh, patients get very worried when there is a callback. And it's important uh, to emphasize to the patient that a callback from a screening mammogram does not equal cancer. As you can see, uh, there will be a thousand screening mammograms and ultimately only five will have breast cancer. Out of every 100 women who get screening mammogram, 10 uh, get called back for additional imaging. So most of the screening mammograms will be negative. Few will get called back and even those few, most are not going to be cancer. So it's important to reinforce this to the patient to help with their anxiety. Another clinical highlight that patients are confused about is breast pain. Uh, a lot of the time, the patient thinks that breast pain equals breast cancer, that something's going wrong within the breast. Uh, that's something that needs reassurance. Uh, in this publication, uh, a study with 799 patients, 95% of the time there are negative findings, and then 5% of the time are benign findings. So no cancers for basically with breast pain. So breast pain, not a sign of breast cancer. If the patient just has breast pain, no other symptoms, then reassurance is uh, very important and explain to the patients what can cause it, hormonal and fibrocystic changes. And what can you do about it? Conservative measures, wearing and sleeping in a supporting bra may help out avoiding nicotine, caffeine, and salty or fatty foods. Uh, this is not uh, typically used, but what may help also is topical creams with uh, diclofenac and uh, evening primrose oil, uh, which may be effective. So when can you not ignore breast pain? If there are other symptoms, such as a breast lump, uh, if there's a new breast lump or it's growing, that's very concerning and nipple retraction, nipple discharge, skin changes, uh, peau d'orange, skin thickening. You can see an image of that on the right bottom there. And this above list here of all these uh, symptoms are concerning if they're new or worsening. So these shouldn't be ignored uh, if they're also appearing with that breast pain. So screening mammogram now. Uh, question here, is it true that one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer? 
So we're going through uh, all the tools that we have now um, with screening. So that is true that one in eight women lifetime will get breast cancer. So uh, it's, it's, breast cancer is very common. Uh, incidents in 2021, is, you can see here uh, how many are invasive cancers and how many are in situ ductal carcinoma in situ cases and the number of deaths uh, in 2021. Among US women, it's the most common cancer after skin cancer. It's the second leading cause of cancer death only after lung cancer. And it's the leading cause of death in women aged 35 to 54. So why do we do screening? Uh, here are the numbers behind it. Earlier prognosis, uh, you end up having a better prognosis by catching breast cancer earlier. So when you catch it earlier, localized just to the breast, the survival is very high, close to 100%. Uh, regional disease, so regional meaning, say just in the breast and in the axilla, uh, the survival is at 83.8%. And even when it goes, well, it gets bad now when it goes to distant disease. So when you get distant mets such as to the lungs and to the bones, uh, that's a later diagnosis. And that's when your prognosis gets worse. So currently over 2.8 million breast cancer survivors are in the United States. 80 to 85% of Breast cancers occur in women who have no family history of breast cancer. So what are the guidelines for screening of women at average risk? Multiple choice questions. So the answer here is annually and beginning at the age of 40. So the American College of Radiology, the American Cancer Society, and the US uh, Task Force guidelines, every major American medical organization uh, is uh, recommending age 40 is when you start. The American Cancer Society mentions age 45, and the US Task Force uh, mentions age 50. So you'll see these different guidelines out there. but. American College of Radiology recommends starting at age 40. Uh, well, actually all of them say that you can start at 40 if you want to uh, talk to your, to your healthcare provider. So the American College of Radiology screening guidelines for when to stop. It's, there's no defined upper limit age. As long as the patient's in good health and willing to go biopsy and treatment, then they can get a screening mammogram. For clinical breast exams and self breast exams, uh, the American Cancer Society, clinical breast exams and self breast exams are not recommended, but that women should just be familiar with how their breasts are. So uh, if they have a familiarity of it, and if there's something new or growing in their breasts, like a new or growing lump, then to bring that up and let their referring provider know. Mortality reduction for screening mammogram uh, due to detecting cancers at a smaller size in an earlier stage. Uh, it's curable, so mammographically visible two to three years before it's palpable. That's why the mammogram is helpful. And also DCIS presenting as calcifications. You're not going to feel that on a clinical exam, so the mammogram helps detect that. In the 50 to 69 year old range, the mortality reduction is from 60 to 16 to 35%. From the 40 to 49 year old range, mortality reduction is 15 to 20%. There's a lower incidence in this uh, age group, 40 to 49. And uh, the younger you are, you have dense breasts. And the younger you are, you also, you also have rapidly growing tumors. Uh, so th that can all explain um, why the mortality reduction is less in the 40 to, nine, to 49 year old group compared to the 50 to 69 year old group. And so fatty versus dense breast. So this is kind of the breakdown uh, of when we read mammograms, 10% of the time you'll see extremely dense breast, 40% of the time you'll see heterogeneously dense breast. And uh, that comprises of the dense breast uh, group. And you can see examples of that in the two bottom 
images. The two upper images, uh, those are examples of on the fatty breast side. So 10% have fatty breasts on the top left and then the top right. 40% uh, have scattered um, fibroglandular uh, density. And the, as you can see, cancer is white. So if you have dense breasts, uh, the white cancer could hide in the background of the dense breast. And uh, so cancers could be harder to detect in dense breasts on mammogram. So here's a mammogram. It's on the fatty side, scattered uh, densities. And uh, this, these are MLO views. And on the left of the screen is the right breast. Uh, there is a, uh, a finding on that right breast. And the next step after you see the finding, which in this case, if it's a one view finding, you call it asymmetry, two view finding, you call it a focal asymmetry. And so you have here spot compression views of the focal asymmetry there, uh, spot CC and uh, nine degree lateral views of the area. And so if the finding persists, um, you end up going to ultrasound and trying to identify a mass. And if you do see a mass, you do an ultrasound guided biopsy. Uh, these are example of dense breast. So you saw an example of uh, breast on the more fatty side and this is an example of breasts that are on the dense side. And when you have dense breasts, again, um, cancers are white and they could hide in this white dense background tissue. So what can help uh, with dense breasts is 3D mammograms, uh, tomosynthesis. Um, so on the right of the slide here, you can see how 3D mammogram can accentuate a cancer that may be obscured by dense breasts on a traditional standard 2D digital mammogram. So the strength of 3D mammogram tomosynthesis is it can help decrease callback rate uh, because as you kind of if you look through the, you know, in, you know, the slices, you'll see that there's no mass, but that it's actually breast tissue. So that can help decrease callback. And you also have increased cancer uh, detection with the 3D mammogram. Again, you're kind of looking through slices of the breast, so that helps you with your detection. And it's uh, helpful in looking at architectural distortion. You can see it better in a 3D mammogram than a 2D mammogram. And when you see architectural distortion, those have a chance of being early invasive cancers. So we talked about screening mammography uh, as a screening tool. The additional screening tool uh, for high-risk patients is screening MRI. An annual MRI, in addition to mammography, is currently recommended by the American Cancer, the American College of Radiology, the American Cancer Society, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network in women at high risk for breast cancer. And so you can see on this MRI here, uh, bottom right, you see uh, an irregular mass in the left breast. Uh, and you can see it with some uh, color, blue color there, uh, that represents a, a cancer that's being detected on the MRI. So breast MRI is our most powerful screening tool um, in terms of how sensitive the exam is to detecting breast cancer. You can see in comparison to doing a screening mammogram or a screening ultrasound, the sensitivity of a screening MRI is extremely high. It's at 84.6%, whereas mammo and ultrasound are about 40%. So MRI is that that's powerful tool that we use uh, for high-risk patients in addition to mammogram. So mammogram and MRI annually, uh, this is recommended for high-risk patients. So the mammogram, uh, why do you still do a mammogram if you're doing the MRI, which is a more powerful tool? Well, MRI may not detect calcifications. So a mammogram can do that. And calcifications uh, can uh, sometimes uh, on biopsy uh, be ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, stage zero early uh, cancer. And MRI uh, shows differences in blood flow. Uh, to malignant compared to non-malignant tissue. It's very sensitive, uh, as I said, but it's not very specific. 
Uh, so it can catch cancers, but at the same time, it can call back uh, findings that are not cancer. So patients uh, could end up with more biopsies. So that's why we don't, although it's a very powerful tool, we don't do it on every patient um, because it's not very specific, but we do use that um, and it's well worth it when the patient's high risk. So uh, repeating the breast MR pros and cons. The pros of a breast MR is that it's very sensitive. The cons are that it's availability, resource utilization, it takes long scan times. So when you're doing a breast MRI, you're taking that MRI uh, machine away from doing other MRIs, such as uh, brain MRIs or musculoskeletal MRIs. Uh, it's very high cost. It's expensive and reimbursement uh, is an issue. So uh, patients sometimes uh, have to pay out of pocket for them. It's like I said uh, before, it's not very specific, although very sensitive. And so it could lead to biopsies that ultimately are benign. So we went over screening mammogram and screening MRI. And now we'll talk about screening best ultrasound. So 3D mammogram tomosynthesis helps with dense breast. So does uh, screening breast ultrasound. Uh, that breast density does, does not limit you from finding breast cancer. So the evidence for screening ultrasound, there have been studies um, that have been done on it. The main reason that uh, screening ultrasounds, the disadvantage of it is that more than 90% of the biopsies that are recommended from screening ultrasound are false positive recommendations. So you end up uh, finding findings on ultrasound, but most of the time they're incidental findings that do not end up being cancer. So it's got a very high false positive rate. So uh, you know, kind of uh, going through the presentation to keep people engaged. I have some questions uh, to uh, keep people engaged here. What percent uh, that are diagnosed with breast cancer have a family history of breast cancer? Just to highlight some important points from the presentation so far is, 15 to 20% have a family history, meaning that most patients don't have a family history. So just because you have no family history does not mean you're not gonna get breast cancer. And that's something that patients are uh, always saying clinic, I don't have a family history. So with earlier prognosis, uh, you have kind of a early diagnosis, you have a better prognosis. So if it's localized uh, to the breast only, what's your five-year survival rate? It's very, very good. It's close to 100%. So 98% five-year survival if you have, uh, if you're able to detect it early. So the tomosynthesis uh, regarding the recall rate, when you do 3D tomosynthesis in addition to 2D mammogram, So the reduction in recall rate by doing tomosynthesis is 30%. So screening high-risk uh, women, which have a 20, over 20 to 25% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer, who does this constitute of? Uh, it's so just because you're high, you have best breast doesn't mean you're high risk. Just because you have two maternal aunts with breast cancer, not necessarily, you know, equate to high risk. Neither does having a maternal grandmother. But if you have a mom or sister uh, with the BRCA mutation, first degree relative, then that will uh, make you high risk. So mom or sister with a breast cancer or the BRCA mutation, uh, that makes you high risk. So for screening ultrasound, the last screening tool that we had talked about, what is the false positive biopsy rate? Meaning that uh, we do biopsies, but uh, they end up uh, being benign on final pathology. So over 90% um, from screening ultrasound are false positive biopsies. So 
now we're going to move on to uh, what I want to highlight uh, in this presentation because I think we can do uh, better as a medical community is identifying high risk patients. So they uh, are identified by primary care OB guy doctors. And so it's important that they are identified and they get the uh, appropriate uh, screening tools, uh, which we had mentioned your high risk mammogram plus the breast MRI. So I did create this uh, presentation and wanting to emphasize uh, the importance of identifying high risk patients and getting them the appropriate screening uh, imaging uh, because you know, for provider knowledge uh, from this paper, uh, University of Massachusetts survey of providers in internal medicine and family practice in ob guy only 31% correctly ident identified high risk uh, patients and only 12% 12, 12 recommended uh, breast MRI for the high risk one. And uh, similar uh, results were seen at the University of Minnesota uh, survey of primary care providers. So uh, we can do a better job here. So identify high risk, what makes you high risk if you're over 20 to 25% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. As you uh, recall from the beginning of the presentation, average risk is one in eight lifetime, which is uh, of the 12% range. So when you get to the 20 to 25% range and above, that's what makes you high risk. And how do you get to that category is if you have a first degree relative, uh, that's mom or sister with the BRCA mutation. And so the patient doesn't need to be tested themselves, but if they have a first degree relative, then they will be in that category. Uh, if the patient has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation, and you can calculate this uh, lifetime risk uh, through the Gale or Tyra Cusick. Uh, these are, are genetic uh, calculators that uh, you can Google and enter patient information to uh, get this percent of lifetime risk. And so patients also that have had radio, radiation therapy to their chest um, when they were younger, um, when they were 10 to 30 years old, and that can be a case when they were young and they had uh, lymphoma and they, uh, in the chest and they needed treatment with radiation. And those patients, because they had radiation to the chest, um, are high risk for developing breast cancer. And uh, additional genetics, uh, leave from any or Cowden syndrome or first degree relatives with these syndromes would make you high risk. But the number of women who do fall into this category is small, less than 2% of all women in the US um, but if we can identify them and get them the correct screening uh, mammogram and ultrasound, not mammogram and ultrasound, but mammogram and breast MRI, uh, that's, that's, that's how we want to improve as a community. So with the uh, breast cancer uh, risk calculators, uh, the Gale model and Tyra Cusick model that I mentioned, uh, these are the websites that you would access. Uh, and the calculators are there. We get an enter patient information. So Gale model versus a uh, Tyra Cusick model. Uh, both models uh, perform similarly in individuals without a significant cancer family history, but in those with high risk features from family history of cancer or from reproductive or hormonal risk factors, the Gale model does underestimate risk. So what I have noticed that most uh, clinics use the Tyra Cusick model because it does not uh, underestimate the risk. So you can start with the short questionnaire and this gives a flow chart of uh, what to do uh, with the answers from the questionnaire. So this uh, short questionnaire of just simply seven questions, uh, this is uh, what kind of the primary care providers uh, should do. Um, ask these questions. If there's just one positive response, then they should make uh, a referral to see a high risk genetic counselor so that you know, the appropriate studies can be ordered uh, for screening. Uh, for breast, that would be mammogram and breast MRI. And at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, where I am, this is our high risk clinic uh, genetic uh, counseling team. So, um, High risk screening, when do you begin? Modality. 
So average risk, you know that you start at 40, but for high risk, you're going to start screening 10 years younger than when the youngest family member is diagnosed with breast cancer. But you shouldn't start any earlier um, than age 25. And so you'll start with uh, a breast MRI uh, in addition to mammography. So higher screening, uh, you do this for first degree relative who has BRCA1-2 mutation. And when do they start? Uh, they start before 40, so between 25 to 40. And the American Cancer Society recommends mammogram and breast MRI every year for a woman at high risk to begin at age 30. So uh, important uh, to take action that all women, especially black women and those of Ashkenazi Jew descent, they should be evaluated for breast cancer risk no later than age 30. So people typically get screening the average risk patient at 40, but we wanna identify these high risk patients earlier. So they should be evaluated before, any, way earlier than 40. So. Uh, no later than age 30, because they can benefit from that supplemental screening, which is breast MRI in addition to uh, a mammogram. Just wanted to highlight the healthcare disparity. In the last slide, I mentioned Blacks and Ashkenazi Jews. Black women are more likely than white women to be diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 50. BRCA mutations are more common in African-American women than in white women. And the triple negative subtype of breast cancer, this is very aggressive. It's more common in black women. And uh, thus there's a higher incidence of aggressive, aggressive breast cancer at a younger age in black women. So as you can see here um, in this graph, um, at, at the top here, the death rate is highest in, uh, in blacks. So uh, to keep it engaging, uh, I, I end this uh, presentation with some how to order exams uh, with some multiple choice examples here. So if you have a 42 year old female with no breast symptoms, no family history of breast cancer, uh, comes in for a routine annual check, uh, what do you do? So no family history, it's average risk patient. Start at age 40, you start getting screening mammograms. So. They're age 42 above, above 40. So now you have a 37 year old female, no breast symptoms. Now the sister was diagnosed with breast cancer at a younger age. So comes in for a routine annual check, what do you order? So since this patient had a sister, uh, she should be getting kind of a supplemental screen. So that's the screening mammogram in addition to the annual screening mammogram. So annual mammogram plus the annual MRI. So a 29-year-old female complains of a breast lump in the right breast. And so what do you do here? So in, a, in this case, the patient has a symptom. So it's not screening. It's actually a diagnostic exam that you would do. So when they're under 30, you're not going to do a mammogram. You're going to start with an ultrasound. So a diagnostic ultrasound. For a 28-year-old female with right breast spontaneous clear bloody nipple discharge, so this is a patient under 30 uh, that has breast symptoms. So since it's, they have symptoms, it's not screening, it's diagnostic. Uh, and since they're younger than 30, you're not going to you know, start with the mammogram, you're gonna start with a diagnostic ultrasound. So now uh, it's a 27 year old female. She comes in with bilateral breast milky discharge by manual compression. So she comes in with breast symptoms, what do you do? It's a little tricky here, I'm trying to trick you. There is no imaging in this case. Uh, you would think they're under 30. So, hey, let's start with the breast ultrasound. But in this case, the clinical presentation is not suspicious since it's bilateral and it's milky and it's by manual compression. Nipple discharge that's concerning is the S's. So it's single breast, not bilateral breast. And it's not milky discharge, but it's serous or sanguineous. There's uh, so clear or bloody, and then not by manual compression, but spontaneously. So it's not a concerning clinical presentation. So the answer is D, reassurance that bilateral breast milky discharge by manual compression is benign and 
related to hormonal fibrocystic changes. So now we have a patient, 41 year old, complains of a new right breast lump uh, or nipple discharge on self breast exam. What do you do? So I, you know, have here 41 years old. So they are over 40, and they're actually over 30. So you can start with a mammogram in this case, uh, diagnostic, since they have symptoms. So a diagnostic mammogram and diagnostic ultrasound is the next step for this patient in terms of imaging workup. Uh, what are indications for breast MRI? So most of the MRIs that we do in, that we, that we read are for the top two reasons, high risk screening and evaluating extent of disease. Breast MRI can also be used for silicone implant evaluation. So all of the above. Uh, so in summary, these are the imaging tools that we have uh, for screening uh, for all women starting at age 40, do a mammogram and ideally a 3D mammogram. And if you're a high risk patient, in addition to the mammogram, you get an annual MRI. Uh, screening ultrasound, uh, it has a high false positive rate, leads to a lot of unnecessary biopsies. So take home points is we are under identifying high risk patients as a community. So we're not identifying them and serving them. We can do a better job here, but it is actionable. So uh, we should start, you know, kind of talking to them earlier, going through questionnaires and identifying them. Uh, we have tools, these calculators, the Gale model, Tyracusic calculators. And then once you identify them, screen them. So if they are high risk, annual screening mammogram and breast MRI. And, um, at my institution at the Baylor College of Medicine, we refer them to our high-risk genetics clinic team. And so that's our team at uh, the Baylor College of Medicine that helps with the uh, high-risk patients. Uh, so that concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, the rest of the time is for Q&A. So it looks like there's 12 in the chat box here. Or just uh, yeah, see if there's a questions. Uh, Abhinav, uh, I, I guess uh, they're just, uh, everyone is uh, kind of, those are just introductions, not questions, but if anyone has questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them now. Um, so if there are any questions, Dr. Nguyen will answer them. Um, we don't have any right now. Okay, I think we just got one. Um, when do you use CSM? Dr. Ju Savani asks. So I'm um, trying to see, is it in the chat box or? Uh, it's in the Q&A box. Q oh, I see it, okay. So that's, that's contrast enhanced uh, mammography. So that's, so if someone, uh, so if someone's not able to get a breast MRI, you can, you, so, Contrast enhanced spectral mammography. Okay. So contrast enhanced mammography, you can, you can use that now if the patient uh, is not able to get a breast MRI. So if they're, you know, they have a pacemaker and they're not able to get a breast MRI and you know, have enhancement evaluated on a breast MRI, they can have that enhancement evaluated on a mammogram um, with that technology. And then there's one more question. And also, I will say that contrast enhanced mammography, uh, it's not widespread news, but it is also uh, in the discussion of a tool that can be used uh, to, to help um, with the dilemma of dense breast. Because again, in dense breast, you can miss breast cancers because they're white. And then in a dense breast with the white background, you can miss the cancer. So contrast enhanced mammography is something that could help with that. Um, so it's just a question of possibly is, is it okay to get contrast every year? Again, there have been some concerns about, you know, getting contrast and uh, with, with regard to MRIs and, uh, you know, the contrast going to the brain. And uh, so there are some kind of, you know, concerns. So I don't know if that's, uh, that, that's definitely something that, you know, may take off um, in terms of dealing with dense breasts. 
um, for screening. And then we have one more question. Uh, Dr. Flavio Ernesto says, thank you for the presentation. And then they ask if you could share the indication for MRI breast biopsy. So uh, the indications for a breast MRI biopsy. Yeah. So if you're suspecting the patient has, you know, usually the two most common cancers are invasive ductal carcinoma, and that usually presents as a mass on MRI and ductal carcinoma in situ. And that uh, could present as non-mass enhancement on MRI. So we look for irregular masses and the near and segmental distribution of uh, non-mass enhancement. Uh, and those are indications uh, on an MRI um, that we look for uh, and recommend uh, biopsies. And then there's one more question. How sensitive is automated uh, ultrasound ABUS in comparison to mammography? I would, uh, you know, it's 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 very sens it's very sensitive. Uh, as we went in the presentation, that you have a ninety percent uh, false positive uh, biopsy rate from kind of doing these ultrasound screening ultrasounds, and so automated breast ultrasound uh, you know, fits in that category of screening ultrasound, and so. It is sensitive, but not specific. So you, you're gonna, you know, you could possibly catch a, a, some more cancers doing it, but you're gonna catch a lot more, you know, benign findings and uh, false positive uh, biopsies. I think- and I, I, I did wanna acknowledge though, I understand that uh, we have audiences from around the world here and I'm, I'm aware of that. So breast MRI is again, a very expensive tool and it's not something that's uh, readily available throughout the world. Uh, and similar to a mammogram necessarily is not something uh, that's uh, readily available throughout the world. So in developing countries, actually, the best tool, the tool that you do have at your disposal is uh, the breast ultrasound. So there's a difference of what kind of uh, ideal care is and uh, what is practical reality. So I do understand that uh, in developing countries, your best tool is ultrasound. And if you, you know, are, you know, get better at uh, discriminating ultrasound uh, benign findings and not biopsying those and, you know, being more specific in, uh, in de determining that it's an irregular mass on ultrasound, that's worth biopsying, um, then you, you can improve your personal uh, kind of sensitivity with your uh, breast ultrasound. So um, you have to work with what you have. So if it's breast ultrasound, get better at that and personally uh, be better at uh, not having that false positive biopsy rate. And then there's a follow-up question to the automated breast ultrasound question. Um, would you recommend automated breast ultrasound for screening? Uh, what I, I would say personally and at our institution, we don't use ultrasound as a screening tool. We use a mammogram for average risk and uh, additionally the breast MRI. I, uh, I, I, I personally would not recommend it. I don't, we don't do it at our institution. Uh, again, because of that high false uh, positive bias rate of over 90%. Um, so automated breast ultrasound has been around uh, for a long time. Um, and I would say it's widely adopted. It can be used. And it's just, you know, with that house high false positive vibes rate, it, you know, it, it really depends on uh, the reader. So if you personally start to call and recommend less biopsies uh, as you get a lot more experience and start realizing that, you know, a lot of these uh, do not worry about them and stop doing biopsies on a lot of uh, what is benign findings, uh, then you could be better at it than that false 90% rate. So personally, you can do better than that, uh, but uh, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a tool that, yeah, I would recommend for screening. And do we incorporate elastography with breast ultrasound? So we can, uh, but typically what's most important with breast ultrasound is you're looking at uh, the shape and the margin uh, of your mass on ultrasound. That's gonna be the most helpful in terms of determining whether it is 
a concerning mass that requires biopsy. Um, again, there's a lot of additional things that you can incorporate into a breast ultrasound, such as color flow. And, uh, but ultimately, what's most important is the shape and the, the margins. Uh, for example, with color, if you add color Doppler and you see, or if you, even if you don't see color, but it's an irregular mass, it's still concerning and still highly likely to be cancer because of that irregular shape. So I focus on the shape and margins, uh, not kind of all these extra features that you have, but they are at your disposal and uh, welcome to use them and shouldn't use them, but uh, it, they, there's additional information um, when you're assessing. Okay. I think that's all for the questions. I had one question. Um, my question was on the consensus of when to begin screening because there's American Cancer Society, and then there's ACOG, and and then there's the task force, preventative task force. So, who do we listen to? Yes, uh, that's a, that's a very great question. I've, I've got that question before because you, know, you see so many different recommendations out there. Forty years old, forty-five years old, fifty years old. You can go. You know, everybody can dig into a lot of papers. Yeah. Think of you just kind of you know keep it very practical, and ask yourself: Have you seen someone with breast cancer before age forty? Have you seen cancer in women's in their 30s? And so you can, you know, there are papers that kind of support all those different age groups, age ranges. But I mean, I just really, you know, you can go into those and have a very long uh, discussion of a, a debate. Uh, and I think what's best uh, is to be very practical about it and just think, have you seen cancer in women in their 30s? And I think it's really important to catch them as young as possible because they are, they have many years life to live. Um, right. You know, in their forties, they have young kids. And, uh, you know, the younger you catch them, and also they're more aggressive these cancers when they're younger. So I, that's why I, you know, I, I do, you know, agree with starting at forty, and, and so even why not thirty? So younger to me, um, you know. So you, you know, again, they get more aggressive, aggressive breast cancers, and they have many more years to live. And uh, you know, again, there's questions of, you know. Can't we just do it every two years instead of one year? Well, uh, you know, easily to explain this is you might have a breast cancer today on the mammogram, but it's just kind of hard for me to see when I look at the mammogram. So now if you wait two years, you would have given it two years time to grow. Right. So kind of, these are all kind of practical things to think about as opposed to, there's always papers to, that people are gonna cite to support um, you know, different recommendations, but practically, um, you know, and people resonate with that more so than uh, digging into a bunch of uh, kind of papers. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think that's all for the questions. We have a lot of thank you messages in the chat. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, it was a pleasure learning from you. Uh, it was a very comprehensive lecture, so taking the time out. So thank you for taking the time out of your schedule for the lecture. We really appreciate it. And I think that concludes our grand rounds for this week. Well, thank you, uh, Avanov, for moderating. And thank you, everyone, uh, for um, kind of uh, listening to my presentation today. It's an honor to uh, be speaking to people around the world. And uh, again, I realize people around the world don't have all these, these tools. And um, you know, uh, if ultrasound is your tool, become better at it and in, improve on that uh, false positive, positive rate is kind of what I want to conclude with. And uh, thank you, everyone. And, uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.